Hey folks, it's Andrew from Gemba Red, and today we're going to talk about the optimum wavelength ranges for red light therapy. Now, the science of photobiomodulation is the science of non-thermal interactions of light and biology, which does not necessarily exclude any wavelengths. It could be UV, could be blue, could be green, red, near-infrared, far-infrared. Where people get confused is that red and near-infrared happen to be the most popular wavelengths for the benefits and for the safety, but it's not exclusive to just those wavelengths. And unfortunately, some companies try to define very narrow wavelength ranges that only their own products can fit, which is a classic move by charlatans to say, oh, we are the only ones that can provide the optimal wavelengths and no one else is doing what we're doing. So you have to be careful of people that have that kind of mentality where they skew the data, they don't have evidence to back it up, and they're just trying to sell you their products and they're trying to limit you from choosing other products that are honestly marketed. And you might have noticed in the past five years or so, the popularity of 660 and 850 in most of the consumer grade red light therapy panels. That doesn't mean they're the best wavelengths just because everyone's copying each other and they're all saying that they're the best. They've never actually proven that they're the best. So you have to be very skeptical and look for the evidence rather than just everyone just copying each other. And it's a huge echo chamber of everyone doing the same thing. But now we know people are getting more educated, that there are a lot of different wavelengths. Different wavelengths can do different things and have different mechanisms, different penetration depths. But I want to take a look at it as looking at red light therapy as a classification of a range of wavelengths that all have similar penetration and similar mechanisms for benefits. So we'll start with one quote from a study that says, Red or near-infrared light are the most commonly used wavelengths in PBM. 600 to 1100 nanometers. So again, notice how they're not spiking out any specific wavelengths, they're classifying it as this range. And this is very common in a lot of introductions for a lot of studies, you just open up, read the introductions, and they talk about similar ranges. Sometimes the ranges are shorter, from 600 to 900, sometimes they're longer. And there are two main reasons why we like these wavelengths so much, and one is the penetration, and two is the mechanisms that they promote. Let's talk about penetration first and start with another quote from the same study. The use of lasers with wavelengths from an optical window from 600 to 1100 nanometers result in deeper penetration and therefore evoke a wider cell light response. So notice how profound that statement is, is that just getting the light deeper into the skin is having that deeper penetration delivering that energy into the cells, we don't even need to worry about the mechanisms because we're getting energy deeper into the body and the body will utilize it beneficially. So that's a really key starting point, that the penetration itself is part of the benefits and the mechanisms. Now we can look at this graph that I made for the optical window of the skin where we have melanin and we have blood as the main absorbers for the shorter wavelengths and then for the longer wavelengths, the water absorption starts to take over. But in between, we get about 600 to 900 nanometers is where you get that optical window where there's a low point in absorption for all these factors and they come together. So like I said, some studies might just say 600 and 900. They might make it a little bit more narrow and that's okay depending on your perspective and what you understand from the science. But when we zoom out of this water absorption graph and we look at the bigger picture, we see that the water absorption does slightly increase around the 900s, but then it goes back down around the mid thousands, around 1040 to 1070, there's kind of a trough of water absorption that seems to be another mini optical window. And at the same time, melanin absorption is continuing to go down. So that makes it another great window for penetration. So that's why there's new studies and new devices that are coming to the market that are around 1060 or around the 1050s, because it has better penetration in that mini window. So let's take a look at one review article that talks about this. Heat can be generated when light is absorbed by water or chromophores such as melanin, the predominant chromophore in the skin. So we have both melanin on one side and water absorption on the other side that could produce heat because it's being absorbed superficially by the skin. And a lot of people only talk about water absorption, they don't talk about melanin absorption. Let's go on. For photobiomodulation purposes, it is more desirable to consider wavelengths with characteristic minimal absorption of water and or melanin so that both are a reduction in heat generation and a greater depth of penetration at the high power settings needed to reach deep tissue penetration. 
So that's key. We want low absorption of water and melanin. That means you get better penetration, and that means you get less heat. Better penetration means less heat because the heat is less concentrated on the surface. And they talk about the 810 to 830 nanometer wavelengths have the lowest absorption of water that is commonly used in PPMT. So again, those are traditionally thought to be the best penetration is 810, 808, and even up to about 830. Those have the best penetrations, where even 850, you get a little bit more water absorption and you get at the bottom most point around 810. But they say the 1064 nanometer wavelength is distinguished as the longest wavelength that is routinely used for photobiomodulation. But they say that 1064, which is again is a specific laser diode, if you try to find the equivalent for LED, it might be a little bit different. But they say 1064 is routinely used for that deeper penetration to bypass the heat production from too much melanin absorption and you get lower water absorption, so you get very good penetration with that wavelength in this window that we never really look at. Okay, let's quickly talk about mechanisms. Like I said, maybe it doesn't matter as much because we just need to get that energy into our cells. And there are three main mechanisms that we're currently considering. Is One is cytochrome C oxidase, two is light-gated ion channels, and three is easy water production in the cells. But to save a long story short, it seems like all three of these mechanisms, even though they seem very different, they all lead to very similar benefits that you get more ATP production, you get more efficient cell production, you get more nitric oxide, and you get a lot of downstream benefits. So even if we go back to one of the studies I mentioned earlier, they show two very different wavelength ranges and mechanisms, but you see how they both point towards the same benefits in the middle. So let's look at an interview with Dr. Hamblin and see what he says about different wavelengths and how they, they compare. This is from the Novathor YouTube channel. You know, we've done a lot of studies over the years, um, and we cannot really detect a difference between red light like 660 and near infrared, let us say 810, 830, 850. So that is a profound statement that he says red is performing the same as near infrared, where a lot of people get hung up that near infrared promises the better penetration and you should get better results and it's invisible and it's mysterious, so you want that. But he's saying red is getting very similar results. He cannot tell the difference in his studies. So let's let him finish that quote because it's so profound. So first of all, all the 800s seem to be the same. And also, as far as we can tell, something in the mid 600s, like 660, is the same as the near infrared. So again, he's basically reiterating that the red and the near infrared are performing similarly. If you get wavelengths in that range around the mid 600s and the low kind of mid 800s, 810s, and you know, 800 to 850, and then the mid reds, those perform similarly, even the red to the near infrared. So it's such a profound statement that I think a lot of people overlook when they listen to him and that they get too fixated on specific wavelengths where he's saying, if you're, as long as you're in these right ranges, you should be getting similar results. So we can get very nerdy and I can get caught up in what's the best wavelengths and which wavelengths are used for certain studies and certain conditions, but we need to take a look, take a step back, look at them as a classification from 600 to 1100 that gets very similar benefits as long as you get the right wavelengths, the right intensity, you use it right, and that's what you need to worry about right now. And we would need very large scale trials to tell us which wavelengths are the best for certain conditions. and Overall, you're probably getting benefits no matter what. So even if you get a tiny marginal difference, is it really worth it? If you have a device already that might already be 660 and 850, and you find out some new wavelengths are so much better, is it really that much better? But we need companies and brands and experts that are open-minded and honest about the data, that they're not gonna massage the data and manipulate it to sell their own products, and they're gonna be stuck in that narrative forever. Like Juve hasn't changed their wavelengths forever. A lot of companies copying Juve aren't changing their wavelengths because they all think they have the best thing. So they're not gonna tell you the latest and greatest science because they're stuck in their narrative that they've already got the best thing figured out. And science is never about perfection, it's about always improving and always learning and always challenging what you think you know. So hopefully that helps you kind of get a 
better perspective of taking a step back, looking at this kind of as a range and a classification of beneficial wavelengths, and that there's still a lot more science to come. That if you start reading the research, they're very clear that they don't know what's the best wavelengths, they're just using what they have on hand or what they think worked from based on previous studies. So there's not a lot of testing every single wavelength in a grid and finding out what's best for certain things. So hopefully that helped. Thanks for tuning in. Let us know if you have questions.